So for those unprofitable customers, it costs a lot to acquire them. They're not the ICP. We had to spend more to get them. If our payback period is longer than 12 months, it is in some cases, and they churn in a year, then we didn't make back the money we spent on them. In that year's time, you have customer success, the customer org, and plenty of other orgs, a lot of extra resources to make this customer successful. Maybe it wasn't a square peg in a round hole, but it was like an oval peg in a, in a round hole. So it needed extra greasing. So you spent more money to acquire them. You spent more money to service them. They left within a year and you didn't make back your money. That is not profitable for a company. All right, you ready? You can kick it off. Hi there, folks, and thank you for joining us. You're listening to Lifetime Value, the customer success podcast, where we help you wrap up the week that was in customer success and start you off on the right foot for the one ahead of you. I am your host, the Larry King of Customer Success Podcasts. My name is Dylan Young. This week's guest of honor, she's been an account executive, an account manager, a CSM, a head of client success. She's a customer success coach at Catalyst as a part of their coaching corner, a founding member of Gain, Grow, Retain. You know the name. She now hangs her hat at Forrester as a certified brain, though her title is simply principal analyst. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Sherry Srebnik with us today. Hi, Dylan. Sherry, thank you so much for being with us today and, and dedicating your time to this. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you do at Forrester? Sure. So my official title is Principal Analyst, and I belong to a team that is um, focused on the post-sale. So we're B2B specifically, um, post-sale customer engagement strategies. And my colleagues and I focus on the post-sale. I specifically cover customer success. We also cover customer marketing uh, and other parts of that post-sale life cycle. Uh, so I still am very involved and immersed within customer success, but now I focus on it from a, a little bit of a different angle. It's a, it was a pivot from being a practitioner to writing about it, but also guiding clients. So I'm also like part consultant. So my job, if I really would simplify it, is, is kind of three basic things. I'm doing research on topics uh, around customer success, whether it's operationalized processes, um, you know, the technology around it, uh, writing on that research so that our clients have, you know, all of that really high level Forrester research to access. And then I also work with our clients, whether it is discussing more about that research and how they might apply it in their own, you know, in their organization or on other questions and concerns uh, or initiatives that they're working on as it pertains to customer success. So I'm um, part writer, part consultant. What made you make that shift? Is, has that always been your greatest interest within customer success is sort of that like cerebral analysis of, of processes and how to build the, the best mousetrap, so to speak? I can't say that it has. It was, a, <laughs> it, I don't know that I had a specific, like, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to be a principal analyst when I grow up. That really wasn't uh, something that I had thought about. But I would say probably, now we're going back a little over like a year and a half or so, because the end of February will be one of my, will be one year, my first official year at Forrester, which time has flown. But when I was really starting to look, I was looking in traditional, like my next step in a leadership role, whether that was more of a, like a senior director level, or even in some cases, maybe at a smaller startup, a VP, you know, starting something from scratch. And I explored lots of different things. And I don't know if I was just burnt out from mm. what was happening at my former role and just all of the, you know, the normal ins and outs of working in a, in a startup. Or if I just felt that it wasn't speaking to me, like I am passionate about CS, but I don't know that I just want to do the next step in the ladder, you know, or maybe it was a combination of both. And I just felt uninspired by the job, like looking at different jobs and, ta and having different interviews. I never left any of them like, I, I am excited about this. It just mm -hmm. felt like I was going through the motions and I was struggling with 
well, if I don't do this, then what do I do? And I went back to kind of help, you know, to help myself, looked at all of the, um, like the strength finder assessments that I had taken, like I've done Gallup, like the Clifton strengths, um, and done a, a bunch of others. And really the good thing is that all of the results were relatively consistent of what, mm. you know, my strengths were. So I said, how do I lean into that? What do I do? Like uh, trying to, what would that look like? And knowing where I am nat naturally attuned, like what I'm naturally attuned to, where I thrive and how I could add value to an organization started to give me pause about what I would be looking for in that role. And as I'm looking at job descriptions and all of that. And then Forrester came along and I was not looking because I had no idea really about the analyst role. Like I've known, I knew who Forrester was and I know what the analyst, like know all about them, but it just, I, I would have not considered that. And they reached out to me about this position. And at first I was, I saw, I'll be honest, I said, analyst, what? I'm not an analyst, but I'm glad that I took the time to read the job description because I was like, okay, okay, I am intrigued. This is sounding like something I could sink my teeth into based on all of the things that I just mentioned about my strengths and, and where I would also have a place to learn. And after a number of conversations, uh, it just felt, it felt exciting. And for each step of the process, it was interesting. It was like, do I want to keep talking? Like, do I want to, like, I want to keep this going, but I'm not sure. Like it was, but I couldn't stop the, the train was moving and, and I couldn't stop it, but I didn't want to stop it. And really, uh, when it came down to it, I had to do a fairly big presentation and I had to put in a lot of time and effort on the work behind the scenes. And I, I put everything into it and it worked out and there was zero hesitation when the job was offered. And I was super excited. And I just knew in that moment that this was what I wanted and that it was a lot of unknown, but I was excited about it. That was a roller coaster of a story. And I love <laughs> the way it ended. It sounded almost like a love story. Like you weren't, you were hesitant but you couldn't stop the the momentum, and in the end, you were very happy. Yeah, I didn't. So want I like the way that the momentum. ended. That was the yeah. biggest thing. I kept questioning it, like in my head, not for only for the reasons of this is not the path I thought I was going down. This is right. not. I'm leaving CS, being a practitioner, and is this really what I want? And I kept saying. And then there was like, you know, the two me's on either shoulder and one was saying, but you didn't want the status quo. So yeah. uh, in the end, like I said, it's almost a year later. I can say it's been a, it's been a ride. There's been a lot to learn. I'm still learning. It takes a long time to ramp up. And there's definitely things I'm learning and have to get better at. It's not, you know, the client work. I won't I, don't, I hate to say anything's easy, but that's a, comf a place where I have a comfort level. The writing right. is definitely a struggle because there's a specific style uh, and that's where it's taking time. But it's it's all been great. And I work for an as far as there's, as a company is incredibly supportive of their people. But I'm also fortunate that the people on my team, uh, the people I work directly with, everyone has everyone's really fantastic. And um, I, I. I couldn't every you know, all of these things just solidified my decision and just was like this, I, I know I did the right thing. So I asked this of everybody, but I think your your answer is going to be a little bit different and, and more interesting, maybe. not No shots at anybody else. But how did you find customer success and why do you stick around? So that's the question. And what I think is interesting is you talked about that burnout and like there were parts of it you really liked. Did you want to keep climbing the ladder? And so I'll be really interested to hear what is it about customer success that really gets you revved up? And maybe juxtapose that against the stuff that, that you didn't love. I think that'll be a refreshing take for folks to hear, too. Well, as you mentioned earlier, I had, in the past, I've had roles as an AE. And I knew, I, I just knew that it wasn't for me. It wasn't about being unsuccessful or not. But it just wasn't for me. And more so because once I build a relationship, I want to continue it, like a conversation. And I know, listen, I know plenty of salespeople who own the account and who, you know, all of that thing. But their main goal, for the most part, 
is new business. They're bringing yep. in business to the organization. We're not talking about renewals here. So I just, that I just, I just could never rectify that with, I wanted to see this person, these, these people, this company, this organization be successful. I wanted to help them. They trusted me to get this in. And now I want to make sure that they're successful. I want to, I want to continue to see this through and I could never, I, I couldn't take the disconnect. And that's when I knew like, what else would I do? And now we're going back some time. And so I went into account management. And at that time, account management, going back a long time, it'll show you how old I am, was very much, you know, like maybe a renewal or you want to buy something else. It was less the relationship land expand um, that it is today. We also know that customer success was born from account management, just with a different, mm -hmm. a little bit of a different twist to it. So as I was, you know, time went on, I remember at one point I was um, unemployed and looking for a new role, or I should say underemployed, but nevertheless, uh, and I, so I was looking for account management jobs. Like that was where my expertise was. That's what I wanted. But the last one or two roles that I had, I was very much focused on the post sale with a customer. I was very much focused on the things I wanted to focus on. Um, there was still quota, so there was that aspect of it. But I really enjoyed the, how do I get you to, how, how can I help you be successful with what you invested in? And that's when I started to see these customer success roles. And I was intrigued. And we're going back quite some time, at least a decade. And I was reading the job descriptions and I said, Oh yeah, yes. And I would just remember nodding and that was it. And then I was like, this is where I want to go because this seems like the next, the evolution of what I'm doing now. And it's not including the things that I am, not, that just, I want to get rid of. Why do I stick around? Well, it goes back to just what I said is I enjoy helping people be successful. I think something I, something I once said to someone was, like, what's my why kind of thing. I really like helping people, like empowering people, helping to educate them so I can empower them to be successful. And a lot of that sounded personal, but so much of it could be interchangeable with what a CSM does. Exactly. The ability to, how to use the product or the service to derive the best value from it. And of course, like we'd like to to point out that ROI and say you you should use us for more stuff, right? But the real satis that's kind of the payoff. The satisfaction is is in actually showing them that value and them getting what they need for right. the relationship as well. And to your point, you just made a, a comment about like you should buy more stuff. What I will say to that is. Just because they've achieved value doesn't mean we should now, they should be buying more stuff. But what you do know is because you have been their partner throughout all of this, if you have the right relationship and you know the challenges they face and what's going on in their organization and that you've helped them reach their goals, then it hopefully is somewhat organic being like, how you present or how those opportunities come up, not just, Hey, you achieved, you know, you achieve level three, unlock, you know, unlock value now buy this, you know, this isn't, you know, a video game and now you've got three extra coins and you should spend them on something. But along the way you develop a relationship based on trust and they're seeing a you know, a return on their investment. Well, what makes sense? You know, I heard your CEO say this, Dylan, what, how does that translate down to your department? And we're talking about, you know, what do you, what's on your shoulders this year? What are you responsible for? Do we have, you know, and then you start thinking, we have, maybe it's not another software product. Maybe it's our professional services. Mm -hmm. So I was paraphrasing. You extrapolated. We're on the exact same page. Oh, yeah, I know. But I wanted to, <laughs> the listeners don't know that, right? So let's just make sure to point oh. that out. Don't you speak for my listeners. <laughs> I don't even speak for them. Anyway, Sherry, do you want to jump into a couple of topics from this week? Let's do it. <laughs> so hesitant. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is not a gotcha moment. Sherry. 
Sherry, uh, the first topic I want to talk about is uh, a quote that came from Greg Danes. And it says, companies that focus on retention tend to have poor retention, while companies that focus on expansion get retention for free. Greg Danes is the CEO of Churn RX, and he posted that on LinkedIn. Just uh, first blush, what's your reaction to that statement? Greg posts some great stuff uh, and it can often be controversial. Uh, I'll give you, I remember, it's funny, I, I hadn't seen him on LinkedIn in quite some time, but I, he wrote something a few years back as well that always stuck with me. Um, in order for people to adopt your product, um, you, people have to, basically people have to change the way they work. Right? And that's Basic has, change management. Yeah. But it's, it comes down to that. And all of a CS... Customer success is really change enablement in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. But him saying that, I will never forget that. That was many years ago, but it stuck with me. So I was happy to see him pop up again. But this was a good one. There's a lot of schools of thought. Like, you know, not a lot. Let me, ch ch let me, expansion is about driving value proactively, right? That's what, what we were just talking about. So if you're focusing on driving that value proactively in general, the renewal would hopefully become a non-event. It's a given because you're already driving value. And again, now we're not even so much talking about the renewal. We're talking about additional products. If you get to that point, then again, the renewal becomes a non-event because now we're, we've got, there's, you know, different things in motion. I would say that that is, you know, that's part of it. It's like, expansion and and if you want to think about it too expansion is kind of a retention strategy because customers are growing and expanding because their use case and because of their use case and because of the success they've had right so you can talk about it from that perspective however there are you know if we want to look at the i guess the market right now because right now with the macroeconomic climate being the way it is you might want to, in some cases right now, you might have to simply just focus on retention, right? Like financial concessions, temporary relief might actually have to be part of your retention strategy. Like for example, during peak COVID, you know, a lot of people were giving some kind of discount matrix uh, or allowing people to pause on payment. So I think it can, you can say it depends, especially given the current situation, but I think aside from that, expansion is a retention strategy. So what he's saying does make sense. Yeah, I might take it a step further and say that I, I think he is right, except there's a ton of outlier cases where there may not be an opportunity for expansion. And that doesn't mean you don't talk to them at all because the because talking to them about retention makes the likelihood less. I don't think that theory holds water necessarily. And I think that goes back to the second point you made, particularly in a tough market. If there's no expansion possible, it's not as though you don't pick up the phone when they call, so to speak, right? I think it's all about that context, right? Like if, if there's an expansion opportunity, then you're obviously already trying to drive value. And that in and of itself is going to drive your retention likelihood up. But it all depends on on the customer. It depends on what your product looks like there's a ton of products out there very early stage they don't have additional stuff to sell so the only thing you can do is is drive retention and that's the only mandate that customer success might have in that scenario yes i, I as always it depends mm -hmm. uh, however i think like you said you you're not not necessarily included that might be like seed series a who only have the one product right now however what i what could be possible from that is in that early stages as you're gathering customers and you know money might be tight and resources but if you've if you have a good product and you're supporting them and you're listening to your customers they might be like and you're hearing similar things from your customers about what they need and what they might want from you based on what the use case is that they have with you today, like why they invested, they could help, you know, you're hearing enough of the same things. You, it's enough of a business case 
where maybe that helps to influence the roadmap and they expand with you. And they were part of the decision to help that expand. So that could be a very big part of a partnership. Like, what do you see? I mean, you know, it's all going to depend on the company, but I wouldn't discount that aspect of it either. Sure. Though that's a healthy chicken or egg argument of is that, you know, retention? Is that expansion? Is that a next level customer relationship? It starts to, the, the lines start to be blurred there, I would say. But I agree, you should be nurturing every relationship you have in, in one form or fashion, even if it's not high touch. All right, Sherry, I want to move on to my second topic. It was um, absolutely planted by you. You did this on purpose. You didn't post it until Thursday <laughs> of this week. And this was your incredible analysis of the combination of these two posts of Nick Meta's theory on the increasing focus on EBITDA and the Chris Hicken, they said folks and their book on value and, and how it fits with product market fit. So tell me a little bit about this thought process and, and maybe summarize that post, that writing for the folks that are listening. And then I have some, I got some, what I think are hard hitting questions. Maybe okay. they're not. They might be. <laughs> so let, I mean, let me be clear. There wasn't, a, I, I didn't, you know, I, you know, that meme with the couple of guys, one's on a big tall ladder and they're around a chalkboard with what looks like all algebraic, you know, uh, equations mm -hmm. yeah. and like the, the Pythagorean yeah. theorem and like e equals MC square. That wasn't the analysis that I did. Like, let's be clear. This wasn't, I don't know about hard hitting analysis, but <laughs> I want to be very clear to everybody. Um, but <laughs> they'll Nick, be able to decide. I'm going to link to it. Nick's post, uh, you know, it, there's been a lot of, first of all, there's just been a lot of conversation for folks, especially, you know, and, and in customer success about owning a number, understanding what the CEO and the CFO care about. And it's really taken on, um, it's actually just increased, especially given the climate we're in, the, all the layoffs across the tech sector and understanding what you need to do, like how, you know, proving the ROI of customer success is really what it comes down to. So he made this post about the CEO and CFO's love language, right? Um, and he talks about EBITDA. I, I assume most people know what it is, but in case you don't, it is earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. It's, you know, CS teams have more an impact on that than they than they actually realize. Uh, and he lists a couple of things that have that some of those areas for discussion. And he talks about, you know, our what we always know, NRR, also our GRR, our gross retention rates, because they matter to company profitability. Um, but then he goes down the list, and the last thing he mentions is customer profitability. And he said, like, this is the big secret weapon. And actually, he said, you in customer success are the secret weapon, really. Because longer term, the best ways for companies to increase their margins is to stop doing things that are unprofitable. Because your, your gross margins are really coming down to, you know, that's going to talk about your profit, right? So in enterprise, in SaaS, just in general, those things tend to be selling to unprofitable customers, which is going back to the growth at all costs, sell, sell, sell to anybody. We all have all been there. But un unprofitable customers are the ones that are typically expensive to acquire, costly to service, and fast to leave. But who owns the data on them? That's customer success, right? Now, if I couple that with what Chris had been talking about um, with product market fit and measuring value, it's that data that customer success owns. And if you're measuring value appropriately, you can help to assess the right fit, which you can then share it with your, um, with your marketing team, with product team, with sales, and all of these in turn are going to affect those bigger metrics like your CAC to LTV ratio, and that's customer acquisition cost to lifetime value. Um, it's going to affect your NRR and your GRR. So these things are inextricably tied. And I will also add as the last thing here, that churn 
is directly related to company valuation. If you've got high churn, it's you know going to be harder to to make money and to really to be have a profitable business. Uh, but really, like I said, that's going to affect company valuation, and that is really what you know your CFO cares about, and so does your CEO. And so when we talk about churn as kind of like the 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 uh, valuation killer, is that because customer acquisition cost is so much more costly as compared to just straight retention of existing customers? Is it that easy? So let's think about lifetime value for a second. That's a metric that really indicates like the total revenue a business can reasonably expect from a single customer account throughout the relationship, right? Mm -hmm. And then how much does it cost cost to acquire them and also your payback period? So for those unprofitable customers, right, if we're saying that they're unprofitable, they're quick to leave. So it costs a lot to acquire them. It may have cost more than normal because it was a harder sell, right? But we were like sales was gunning for it. They're not the ICP. They went after them. So it was a hard, it was a little bit harder. So we had to spend more to get them. If our payback period is longer than 12 months, which it is in some cases, and they churn in a year, then we didn't make back the money that we spent on them. In that year's time, you have customer success, the customer org, and plenty of other orgs because no one does things by themselves. Mm -hmm. A lot of extra resources to make this um, to make this customer successful. Maybe it wasn't a square peg in a round hole, but it was like an oval peg in a, in a round mm -hmm. hole. So it needed extra greasing. So now it's you're spending more money because you've got a, your higher cost to serve. So you spent more money to acquire them. You spent more money to service them. They left within a year and you didn't make back your money. That is not profitable for a company. So if you are then measuring value appropriately, making sure they, you know, why are they investing? Do our use cases match? Are we measuring... The, the measuring value throughout the customer life cycle. Are they reaching their, their objectives? Do we have the right relationship? Again, can we expand? All of this can help. We have this data, which allows us to not only find the biggest problems and solve them earlier, but it also allows us to find the biggest opportunities. And then, like I said, we can go and share this with our sales team. So helping them acquire the, the right ICP and help make sure they're set the right expectations. We can share it with product and making sure that they're delivering impactful features that are easy to use. Also sharing it with marketing so they can um, create and deliver high value content and also set the right um, effective pricing and packaging. It was, all of that plays into it. So this data that customer success has can help these other teams that are all part of the GTM motion and hopefully make, you know, reduce our costs, re you know, reduce um, the cost to acquire because we're acquiring the right fit. We have a longer, we're extant, you know, ex making more money over time because they're staying with us longer and we're expanding our footprint. Um, we're evolving with our market, like all of these things add up, which also drives down churn and drives up our valuation because we're increasing where churn is going down, but our NRR is hopefully going up. So that is my very unscientific response to that. It sounded scientific to me. Uh, if I wasn't wearing these headphones, you'd see the, the steam coming out of my ears. <laughs> but I appreciate it. I think that's that's helpful, and uh, I may ask you to return so we can do just an entire conversation on the levers you can pull to to help find or or target more effectively, and then measure the success of those ideal um, product fit customers. Sherry, I want to cover one more topic, and and we don't have to spend too much time on it. This is kind of my my personal kudos. So at the end of this show, I will ask you for uh, your CS player of the week, as well as your referrals and recommendations. But this is one I, I personally want to give, uh, and it is to uh, the Catalyst marketing team and the, the actually their newsletter team specifically 
dedicating their entire newsletter for January to calling out the mental health of everybody who reads that newsletter, which is mostly customer success folks, but I think you could expand it out, calling out um, the the market that we're working in right now. It's really tough. A lot of folks are finding themselves um, without a job overnight, and if you're not, maybe you're doing a lot more with a lot less, uh, a lot of pressures on everybody out there. So just a personal kudos to Catalyst for taking what is a, a valuable real estate in their newsletter to talk about that. Well, knowing Catalyst are great. Um, Edward and Kevin are really thoughtful leaders. And I think it was the summer of 2020, the pandemic summer, that they, when people were back in the office or starting to, was, was it 20 or 21? Either way, I think it was 20. God, who um, knows? Yeah, anymore. I know. It's a blur. They <laughs> had like a mental, I forget what it was called, but it was all about mental health. Like they gave their team off whatever, you know, and then we had, they had did, um, had an event, like an after work, you know, meet up like a, a happy hour event, which I, which I attended and it was great to get people together, but it was really all about mental health and maybe, you know, making sure you take care of yourself. So I know that they are very thoughtful and intentional when it comes to that. And they're also very open about their own struggles and this, you know, and, you know, what really, um, you know, made them want to do this. So I will give kudos to the two of them and their leadership. Mental health is, uh, you know, I am not afraid to talk about it. In fact, Back in 2020, I, myself, alongside three other CS folks, were part of a two-part podcast, um, a Gainsight podcast that was run by Adam Joseph, who was like director of CS and I think EMEA, and about um, mental health and burnout for customer success professionals. I was really excited to do it. I was really proud of my participation in that because I think saying the ability to say if, you know, I am not okay is not always easy for folks and saying that you need support and help, whatever that is, whether it's therapy or not, I, I think we have to make, we have to normalize that. And that's why I have zero problem in speaking out about it. And why I did that podcast? Because I want people to know that it is okay to not be okay and to ask for help. Um, I want to help reduce the stigma around those feelings you should be able to talk to your to your leader, to your manager, to whoever, and say, I need some mental health, I need a mental health break. This is what's going on without feeling like there's going to be retribution for it. It says more about you. It's it's a it's it's show strength of character. It is not a weakness. It shows strength when you can say, I need help. Don't be afraid. There are no stupid questions, and vulnerability is not a bad thing. No, absolutely not. So, Sherry, let's move on to uh, my favorite segment within the podcast. I make no bones about it. This is BS in CS, where we give you an opportunity to pick a bone. So if you had to choose one, what is the trend, catchphrase, or otherwise related to customer success that you would like to see done away with forever, Sherry? Oh, this is... Um... Hard to pick just one, right? Well, I'll give you something that, that had been trending for a while. It seems to have died down, but it was happening probably around end of Q3 and into Q4, and it made me want to dive out a window. <laughs> I was very passionate about it. It got on my nerves. Um, Bringing it back. Customer success is the new sales. Stop it. Stop it right now. <laughs> I know where it's coming from. And I don't, and I, a lot of people said, no, it's not the team. It's not the person. It's the outcome. But that phrase is confusing. It's not the new sales. Is it a, customer success is a growth engine. They are attached to revenue. They are a revenue generating enterprise. And it's part of, you know, again, it's your customer base. How do you support, support your customer base? But saying it's customer success, even that the outcome is the new sales, I just, it rubs me the wrong way. Cause then it's like, well, then what happens to your chief customer officer? And what happens to this? And it's just, 
it's misleading. I, I think it's downright wrong. I understand the sentiments behind it, but new business sales and what customer success does, is there still revenue involved? Yes, but it's a different skill set and there's different behaviors. And when you say it like that, like I said, it's not, it's, it's just really misleading. And they're both part of revenue, but in different columns. It doesn't account for all of the work that CS does. And I feel like it shows a fundamental lack of understanding for the complexities of customer success and what's needed to drive that motion and what's needed to retain a customer and what's needed to deliver on the brand promise that was sold from the website, from the awareness and consideration stage, from what sales said, from what marketing did to get them through that funnel. I'm not saying it's harder than what sales does. I don't want to get into that argument because there's no reason to have it. E everyone has their own challenges. Customer success, I think, creates the conditions for, those, for the retention and expansion to happen. Do they do it completely by themselves? Also, no. But they are a large part sure. of it. And like I said, just reducing it to the new sales as if it was this new thing, like, oh my God, customer success... No, we don't need flashy neon lights. This isn't Vegas. It just, it, it, it was like, you know, you have to give it like, oh, it's the new sales. Just, just stop. I'm like, no, that's what bothered just me. Stop. <laughs> just stop. I think it's a fundamental, you, you're right. It's a fundamental misunderstanding of what it is that customer success does. It's res it, it is increasingly responsible for a portion of revenue. Okay. But that does not mean it's sales. If your only understanding of revenue generation is via sales, well, that's a different problem entirely, but they are not the same thing. There is a selling aspect. I don't want to say that, sure. but it's not, you're not hunting. It's, it's different. It's, cons it's consultative. Again, it's creating the conditions mm -hmm. for that by making sure they adopt and achieve their outcomes and they see how we're measuring value. It's just different. It's different. And I just didn't like that. And of course it died out. You know, it was one of those things. Everyone's on like the customer six and then it caught on and now it's dead because it didn't, it, moving on. Like, just no, leave it. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Sherry, let's wrap it up. Okay. Uh, let's move to our conclusion. The first thing I like to ask is who in the customer success space in the past seven days has caught your eye you think deserves a little bit of kudos for moving the profession forward. Who is your CS player of the week? That's so hard because there are so many people that are writing some really, you know, great stuff. And it, maybe it's not a post, it's in the comments. Um, so I'm going to break the rules because I don't like rules. I don't like being constrained. And nominate me? Thank you. I want <laughs> to, uh, you know... There's a whole bunch of people that are doing great things out there and that are sharing really great information and want, helping to move us forward. I mean, you, yes, you have this podcast. You've got me on it. So there's that, right? Um, my friend Jan Young, who I believe you spoke to um, or are speaking to, Rachel Provan, um, Jay Nathan always has great posts, my friend Bob London, uh, Jeff Kushmerick. There's a bunch of folks out there that have some really great content. I'm missing people. So that list is not meant to be all inclusive um, by any means, or it's not, a, you know, it's not an exhaustive list, but there are a lot of people that are putting out great content on LinkedIn and I highly recommend giving them a follow. So you, you broke the rules and I thought you were going to abstain from voting for anybody, but no, you stuffed the ballot box. <laughs> you put every name in there, which is fine too. It's fine. They'll all get a call out. Uh, number two, referrals and recommendations. So, Sherry, if you could take the audience members and point them in the direction of any one thing, and it does not have to be customer success related. Jan made the mistake of telling me everybody should go home and practice their discovery questions, and I laughed her out of the room. What I meant was, is there a book you're really vibing with? Is there a podcast you're really loving? TV shows. Personally, I love Yellowstone, and I told Jan the same thing. Or maybe there's an activity that you're passionate about, whether it's like a, a, a sport or like a volunteer thing. 
just throw it out there. Referrals and recommendations. Okay. And this is completely has nothing to do with customer success because all Good. CS and no, no other thing else makes me a makes makes me a dull person. And I'm like I tell people, it's not my identity. Customer success is something I do. It is not who I am. Uh, so with that said, there's a bunch of podcasts I listen to on that are in my regular queue that I really like. Um, I love Pod Save America. Call that whatever you want. Um, yeah, you can judge yeah. me on that, but I'm I'm a big. I love the Pod Boys, and they are been a regular for years. Uh, I love um, Smartless, which is um, it's Will Arnett, uh, Jason Bateman, and Sean Hayes. They oh, wow. are longtime friends. They have a wonderful rapport with each other. They're incredibly funny. And each podcast is they always have one guest for like an hour and they kind of just, you know, bullshit for an hour. And it's great because I could listen to them talk, the three of them for hours because they're so funny. So I love Smartless. Uh, I also love um, Conan O'Brien's podcast, John Stewart. I have loved John Stewart since he hosted The Daily Show. Mm -hmm. I think he's incredibly smart. Um, so you can see where I go with what I listen to. Um, mm -hmm. Picking up a vibe. Yeah. That's so okay. That's, uh, there's some other stuff in there that I occasionally like, occasionally listen to, but those are typically the ones I check. Those are you, my, my usual suspects. Um, book, I'm about to start. I'm a big U2 fan. Uh, so I just bought Bono's book, Surrender, and my friends and I have tickets to see him in, in New York in um, in April. And I solo? also, yeah, he's or... doing a solo tour for the book. It's not like necessarily I'm singing, it's storytelling, because Bono's a okay. fantastic storyteller. Yeah. Uh, and I also read Dave Grohl's book, um, Big Foo Fighters his, fan. I'm also reading his other. His autobiography? Yeah, it was really was good. So I good. mean, I'm reading other things too, but if. Dave Grohl's just. He's just casual, like best friends with Paul McCartney. That blew my mind. Yes, <laughs> yes, I love Dave Grohl. Uh, so those are um, some books I've read. I'm also reading some literary fiction, uh, but trying to get back into reading more that's not business related because again, my mind needs a break from those things. I'm not mm -hmm. a big TV watcher, and then just now trying to figure out like some other things for myself and like pursue other interests for the year. Like what other things am I interested in or that I want to take up? There is that. I also really like That's history. Cool. I'm a, kind of a history, like love learning more about. Don't watch, um, don't watch TV, like learning about history. Are you sure it's CS that's making you dull? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I do watch some TV. I can't get into like <laughs> shows the way I used to. So I like a good mm -hmm. documentary or something that's just like four episodes of like this. It was a docu series and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, or something yep. that I don't have to follow each week. Like there's a food. Uh, was it on Netflix? Was it Netflix? Um, somebody feed Phil. So he's in a different city or country all the time, and like the food in that city. So it's a much more lighthearted Bourdain. I feel like. Uh, mm -hmm. I love that. And David Letterman's My Next Guest Needs No Introduction. I really loved that series. In fact, he just did a special episode where he traveled to Ukraine and met with Zelensky. And wow. it was, did he? but he That's also cool. went around Ukraine and spoke to other people. And it was such a good episode. For Z President Zelensky's security, they had to meet on the platform of a subway station in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, it. really good. And I, I enjoyed it. So if that's if you're into that stuff, I would highly recommend that episode. Again, stuffing the ballot box. But um, yeah. it's all good stuff. I like it. Where can folks connect with you, Sherry? I'd say the best place is LinkedIn. Okay. That's the easiest. Short and sweet. Yeah. I'll put the link in the show notes. Thank and where you. can folks learn more about Forrester and maybe specifically the work you do at Forrester? Well... Forrester.com. I mean, if their company, if they're, if, if they're interested in, uh, <laughs> in pursuing, um, a relationship with Forrester, I could certainly set them up with the right people. I can facilitate that conversation. Um, we work with a lot of tech companies, um, and our big, um, B North American B2B summit is coming up. It's June 5th through 7th in Austin, Texas. Uh, we put on a fantastic conference and our big musical guest, we do one of one big event. It's, um, Nathaniel Ratcliffe and the Night Sweats. They're going to be our big performer uh, for our event. So I'm really looking forward to that. And I will be 
um, hosting two sessions. So if you are interested, you could always go to our website and find out more about Summit and register. And you know what? I'm going to say this. Um, I posted about this last year. I wrote a blog post on it after my first summit when I just was in, a, in attendance because I was too new to have participated. But one of the things that I loved about it was it was, you know, there's a lot of marketing content, but marketers, sales, product, it's so many diverse categories. And I thought, here we are as CS leaders and saying, pay attention to us. We want the seat at the table and all of these things. And how do we build these relationships with our functional peers? Well, what about going to a conference with them? Instead of just going to CS conferences, and then, you know, we're saying everyone has to get out of the echo chamber. But what are you doing to get out of the echo chamber? And I think that is more than just following other sales or marketing folks on LinkedIn. And I understand budgets are tight, but instead of going to three customer success conferences, and listen, they're good because I have been to them all multiple times. But how much more impactful would it be is if you sat alongside your marketing leader and your sales leader and a product leader and you you went together as a group and you all sat in sessions that pertain to each other, how much more knowledge sharing, how much more dynamic and impactful can it be if you hear what's coming down the pike or cutting edge research for these areas, you know more of what they're facing and how do you put that together so you can form a really great strategy that helps the company achieve its goals as well as its customers. Like, rather than just going to the conference that pertains to your functional area. So that's my pitch on that. Um, I think it would be great to see more CS folks at our our conference, if for no other reason than you can come see me. (laughs) Spit and fire with that pitch. That was spirited. I liked it. Uh, and I agree. I think, you know, the echo chamber scares me. And the more we can get out of it, the better it is for, for us personally, professionally, maybe for our mental health, too. Um, so that's a good way to, to loop it all back. Sherry, I want to thank you for being a part of this, for taking your time to um, contribute to this and for sharing your thoughts. I had an absolute blast. I hope you did, too. I did. Thank you for having me. This was fun. You've been listening to Lifetime Value, the podcast for customer success professionals. If you like what you've heard, please rate our show and subscribe wherever you find your podcast. Please note that the views expressed in these conversations are attributed only to those individuals on this podcast and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of their respective employers. For all inquiries, please reach out via email to dylan at lifetimevaluepodcast.com. Find us on YouTube via our channel, Lifetime Value, and find us on the socials at Lifetime Value Podcast. Until next time. You mean to tell me you haven't uh, paid attention to the other episodes we've published? No, I have not. (laughs) If it's not in my Spotify queue, like my normal podcast that I listen to. Get it in there. You can get it in there. You want me to tell you the truth? I don't listen to anything customer success when I'm working out. Oh, well, shit. I don't listen to any to any podcast while I'm working out. What am I going to get my motivation from Tim Ferriss while I'm trying to you know, break a sweat? Oh, no, I don't listen to Tim Ferriss. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs>